This is Kevin Pruitt with another episode of Rising Tide Startups, and my guest today is Tony Watley. Tony, thank you for joining us on Rising Tide. Kevin, thanks for having me, and I can't wait to engage your audience. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time. I know that you are a very busy man because I, like I mentioned off camera, I, I stalk you on all the social medias, so I know how busy your time and how valuable your time is. So thanks for taking a little time Saturday morning. And so, so share with our audience, who is Tony Wadley? I guess if somebody doesn't know me, the easiest way to talk about that is that I'm, I'm kind of grown into this this label of the side hustle millionaire. It's the title of the book that I wrote that came out almost a year ago, it became a number one bestseller on Amazon. And that was a story that's the title of the book is actually based on my own business story. It's right. Businesses. I've always had a, a busy career, professional engineering, project management, oil and gas industry, but my real passion is cars. So well, actually I have two real passions. I have a passion for business and I have a business, a, a passion for cars but I always wanted to be in the automotive industry. So I wasn't working with them that it didn't pay me enough compared to oil. So I created companies within the automotive racing and performance world. And the one thing I started back was 2001. It's called LS one tech.com is an online performance car community. And it grew into one of the largest of its kind on the internet. And we ended up selling it about six, seven years into the business for a multiple seven figure exit plan. And that became the basis of the side hustle millionaire. It's how, how I built something, scaled it, and the mindsets and the, the tactics and things that still apply today. Because let's, let's face it, business fundamentals haven't changed in very much at all. It's actually gotten easier nowadays. Sure. Well, it's interesting. I mean, as I was doing a little reconnaissance before uh, we got on the on the phone here and and uh, got on Zoom, and you mentioned that uh, you know this was a side hustle that just kind of exploded on me. And and uh, I mean, there there aren't many side hustles that people can say. You know, I exited a few years down the road with two commas in it. You know, to the left of the decimal point. So, um, tell us. I mean, what was the was it just a kind of that Kairos moment of just a perfect, like perfect storm of timing and interest and passion and availability and hard graft, hard hustle? I mean, what was the thing that, that you would say was the kind of that catalyst that, that said, hey, this is why it exploded? I think most people start businesses without the right purpose or the right passion. They think about money as their, their purpose. And if you ever start something because of money and that's your sole purpose for doing things, you're not going to last very long. That's how most people tap out when things get tough and money is your only purpose. You're going to quit. That's how most people are. Hmm. So if you have some strong purpose or a sense of community or just something that you're building. And what I like to tell people is you need to build something bigger than yourself. A lot of people think that they need to be the top of that pyramid, that top of that mountain, but that's not the case. A lot of times the, the businesses that we build that do very well are a lot bigger than the individual. So you got to remove that self-limiting belief right away that you are not the top of that. You need to build something much bigger than yourself. And I'm a big fan of building communities and things that people can get behind and support and feel like they're a part of, because let's face it, we all like being parts of different communities, whether that's our hobbies or talents or skills or any kind of special knowledge. And, if you're part of that community, it's just a, it's a, it's a human factor. We like being in those things and they're going to get behind that. They're going to wear your logo. They're going to be your indirect salespeople promoting what you do, inviting their friends into the same network. And that's how companies get really big. It can't just be Tony Watley. Right. Like I, I never wanted to start a company called Tony Watley and just be the, the end, you know, the glass ceiling that's going to keep that company from growing. Cause let's face it, people aren't going to be walking around with my name on their shirt you know, and, you know, unless I'm like some musician or something, you know, and like some rock band or something, you know, that might be a little different. Those guys get a, but even Hollywood actors don't walk around, you know, they don't have people walking around with name, their, their personal brand on, you know, exactly. so, yeah. so it's create something bigger than you. And, you know, one of my mentors online is Ed Milet, and he has this real profound statement that hit me, shared about, you know, probably less than a year ago. And what he told us is that your dream has to be bigger are big enough to enclose, enclose all of the other dreams of the people that support you. So if you have family as your support network, they have dreams. Your dream has to be big enough to contain theirs. If you have audience, if you've had employees, they all have their own dreams, but what you're selling them to get them to support you, that dream that you're selling them has to be big enough to contain their dreams. And when you start to think about that, it's like, it's gotta be a lot bigger than just wow. me. I'm just the, I'm just a megaphone. I'm just the leader of this, but I'm not the end all. 
That doesn't sound like 10x. That all sounds like 100x. Maybe, maybe bigger. Have that mentality. Maybe a million x. Yeah, maybe bigger. So, so tell me things you specifically did with, uh, is it, you said LS1 Tech. So what are the things that, that you did that really kind of created this inertia? Was it, you know, you said, you, you know, community. I mean, did, did it involve podcasting, social media, or the specific, you know, I guess, elements of that growth that you, you really focused on? We actually had it hard because social media like Facebook didn't come out till 2008 and for the general public. And we actually sold that company in 2007. So we actually did all this before social media was around. Oh, I mean, we had, yeah. we had Google, we had ma magazine ads, we had placed ads and things like that. But here's the thing that most people fail at when they start a business, even as a side business. A lot of times think, people think a side business is almost like a part-time job or a hobby. When you pursue a side business as a hobby and you treat it like a hobby, you're gonna get hobby level income. That's how it is. So if you think about it, you take it serious, you build something that you have real passion behind and you treat it like an actual business and do your taxes and report things and keep yourself honest and learn how to scale, learn some marketing, learn some salesmanship and how to build these companies just like the big companies do, even if you're doing it part time as a side hustle, that's when the companies can really scale because you start to remove these you know, amateur level behaviors and bad habits that even right. some big companies have. So if you treat it serious, and I have one business partner, he was in Chicago, I'm in Houston. We treated it like a business. We both had professional careers. We didn't need the money. We started the company based on the passion for the cars that we had, thinking, hey, if this makes any money, it's going to still be a fun place to hang out. But let's, let's make sure we're always treating the customers who are the visitors to the website even if they're getting it for free because they're visiting the website, they're still our customers. Mm -hmm. Because we understood that the more customers we had, even if they were free, we would have the leverage to go after the advertising revenue. Just similar, exactly. similar to a magazine business model, similar to right. a Google business model. I mean, just to give you an example, the Google ads placed on that website generated over $200,000 a year in profit. Wow. And that kind of gives you an idea of like the bigger the audience that you can build, the more scale you have, this, this, website went worldwide. We had people in Australia, England, wherever these cars existed, they were on our website and it was based on General Motors performance cars. So we had Cadillac, Chevrolet, they were even advertising on our website. They even treated us like you know, media VIPs to all their unveil events. I even wrote some articles for General Motors to be published in the magazines. So that's how you kind of build things. You have to build that community of people to support what you're building. And they're the ones that are going to help grow this thing. That is, I mean, that is so true. It's kind of a universal truth in, you know, really whatever you're starting. I mean, you, you kind of decided, you know, how do you build an audience and how do you kind of capitalize on that particular audience, you know, given the, the time, you know, the, the time period that you're in and the available, you know, options that you have, you know, whether social media, whether it didn't exist, but you had other alternatives at that time to, to kind of focus on. So you exited that in, say, you said 2007, 2008? Correct. 2007. So we've got about a 15 year period here. So or 12, 12, 12 or 13 year period. So what do you, what have you done for the last 12 years? So you just sat back and, and relaxed and enjoyed the, the, <laughs> the interest off of. Yeah. Off I mean, I've, I've, had, I've had an incredible life. I I'm, yeah, definitely, definitely changed the life factor. I mean, I was able to buy this big custom home and a bunch of cars and enjoy a lot of travel with my wife. That's what we like to do. And I just kind of just work, work mo mostly focus on family and doing things like that. But I've always had this successful career in the background. So the oil and gas, I was in middle management range. I was making multiple six figures, even on the salary range in the corporate level. So not only have I done business success, I've done corporate success. I know how to navigate those channels. And I've learned a lot of things in those companies about the process and the systems and how interfaces work, the risk analysis and measurements. So a lot of things I learned from the corporate structure also apply to small business. I'm able to take what I've learned from managing nine figure international, you know, two year projects down to the small level. And here's the thing I started doing consulting. I started helping these large corporations with their, their scaling or building departments or creating processes and systems for them. But what I found is that while they could pay me a nice rate to go sit there and do that for them, I was not getting the traction with those people that I wanted because they weren't adopting the changes that I would propose. They would say, yeah, that's a great idea. This is all good stuff. And but this is how we've always done it. And I'm thinking, well, why are you hiring me to come out here to help you guys <laughs> and pay me these multiple six figures to tell you guys how to improve things and you don't take any advice. And it's just really frustrating for someone who's very creative that likes to see that process and actually see results. 
and they would cut me the check and be, thank you very much. And that's fine. A lot of people would accept that. But I started feeling like, you know, I, I need to start dealing with people who are actually the decision makers in the companies. Mm -hmm. So I shifted my focus in the last 18 months to fill, start working with smaller companies where I'm actually working with the owners or the CEOs of yeah. those companies where yeah. we can get actual results. Because to me, I'm a results driven person. And if I'm not seeing results, I don't feel like I'm doing my job, no matter how well I can help you prepare for those results. If you don't do them and we don't see improvements, then I, I feel like I wasted my time there. Well, I, uh, it's, it's really interesting to kind of see this transition that you've made. I mean, you know, you probably exited such, at a, such a level that you really could have almost coasted, you know, for, for you know, hey, I've done my, done my gig and, and I'm, I'm out. But when you, if you look back at, you know, 15, 20 years ago, were you, um, you know, I love the distinction between an entrepreneur and an intrapreneur. Were you entrepreneurial within these companies that you worked for? I mean, did, did you, uh, I mean, when you're in the oil and gas industry, were you constantly saying, hey, we can do this better? Is that how we can improve our department? How we can improve the, you know, the supply chain things? Anything that you were engaged in, were you, did you have that entrepreneurial itch even as a, as a corporate employee? Absolutely. And that was always, even back to when I was 15 in my first job at McDonald's, I was always trying to figure out how to make things better so they can have more customer service or more profit. Even, even some of the things we come up with on the menu that they got submitted to corporate, you know, that they would actually adopt for our locale. So it was kind of fun to be playing in that kind of field and have someone else's money to understand and manage that and try to get them more. But here's the thing though, when you are an entrepreneur and you're trying to do these type of things, sometimes the people that you work with don't appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, they, they basically, they like to be the type that just checks in or takes that salary check, does their job, keeps their head down, doesn't rock the boat, doesn't try to improve anything, doesn't argue about anything or making anything any better. They don't worry about what the company's making. They just want their paycheck. And honestly, I would never hire anybody like that if, you know, for my own companies. But there's a lot of people out there in that workforce that just want to do their due and just kind of go home at five o'clock. I was always the one that was challenging things to improve. Like, hey, why, why do we need these three communication interfaces? Why can't we consolidate these things, make it efficient for all three parties involved, save two hours each person that goes into productivity and makes an increase in the bottom line of your company. And a lot of times you have these managers, a lot of times will be like, oh, that's a great idea, but then they wouldn't do anything. And I'm like, yeah. Mm. You guys are wasting the skills I have. So honestly, it's almost a, it's almost something that's a blessing in disguise when you think about it. When you have that mindset and you're not getting that outlet and you're not being able to be creative, you're not being able to take on those leadership and responsibilities within your corporate job, that makes you force yourself to go outside and start doing things. Exactly. Elsewhere. And that's why I started creating side hustles because I wasn't getting those things, especially in my 20s and 30s because I didn't have the experience yet. You know, here I am in you know, my 30s, mid 30s, and I was already a multimillionaire, and I'm working for corporations, and I'm run, I know I can run circles around everybody I'm reporting to, and that's not being egotistical. It's like, no, I have actually results, and I know that I can run circles around these people. Right. And some of them embrace that. Some of them are like, man, I love having you on my team. Let's do this. You know, let's get this stuff going. That's awesome. And then you always have the people that had that, that the animosity about, you know, feeling inferior, not, not that you make them feel inferior, but anytime they see somebody just crushing it on, an, on a good level, investing in themselves, always taking the, the positive and doing the right thing, when they know that they can't keep up with you, they start to try to hold you back and throttle yeah. you down and give you lesser responsibilities. And they're, you know, sometimes they'll try to take the credit for the things that you're working on. And I believe in teamwork. I think we should all take credit for the entire team but you'll find people who will go out of their way to throw roadblocks in front of you and, and speed bumps to try to keep you down a level. They'll, they'll certainly assume credit and deflect blame. You know, it's, it's, it's very easy. I mean, it really is like an insecurity mm -hmm. you know, within themselves. But um, I, I, the reason I asked that question is, is, you know, I've done a number of these interviews and it's interesting people that have made that transition from, you know, cause say corporate life to kind of even the side hustle or going, going all in and, you know, full time in, in whatever their entrepreneurial endeavor is, it seems like that there was always this level of frustration. At some point in time, they, they kind of met the wall or they met the ceiling that said, you know what, they're not appreciating the ideas that I come up with. It's actually, it's actually frustrating to them because they, they think maybe I'm too scattered or I'm not focusing on my job or whatever that, that happens to be. And, 
And uh, it, I think you're right. It, it could be a blessing as well for the individual to kind of almost kick them out of the nest, you know, so to speak and say, Hey, you know what, you've got to go scratch your own itch. If, if you are, if, or you're going to be, you're going to be continually frustrated in this, in this endeavor. But um, I wanted to, to kind of take a little deeper dive into, into, into Tony Watley's head. And, and so I, I read somewhere, I think it was on maybe on your website that you, you talked about, I really didn't have a, you know, specific coaches or whatever, as I was kind of taking this journey, but yeah, this is, this is, you know, one thing that you do now is, is coach, but was there a reason for that? Or was it just a different time period? Or, you know, I know that your own lessons have, are feeding your own coaching business, but what was the kind of unpack that just a second? I would say that it was, in the period that I was coming up, I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s and in the 90s. And best back then, we didn't have these online video conferences. Everything was by telephone or emails. Emails were new relatively in the mid 90s. Yeah. So the, the communications were very scarce. And to get some you know, successful person on the phone, like to get their time like in that way, just really was difficult, especially me growing up lower middle class and not really having any kind of network of people like that. Mm -hmm. with online communities to go search people out and, and collaborate with them. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what are you going to go like thumb through the phone book and like, call everybody? <laughs> hey, what do you do? You know, and so it's really hard unless you're networking to somebody or somebody's father. And so I would ask anytime I had opportunities to ask questions of people that I knew that were successful. I was always that kid that would ask questions and was curious. And, you know, I go visit a, a friend and have a big house and the dad's, you know, sharing information. I say, like, Hey, what do you do for a living? You know, how do I get there? And it may not something may not be something I'm actually interested in, but I'd like to hear their answer to kind of just file that away and understand maybe I can use that information later on, or maybe they've already created this path that exists that I can kind of reverse engineer and get there. So I was always very curious and I've always asked questions. I think nowadays it's a lot easier to find mentors because you can go on Facebook. You can find people like myself. You can find podcasts. You can read a lot more books. There's a lot more books on personal development nowadays than ever. I mean, I wrote one myself, it's business and personal development. Mm -hmm. But back then we had maybe 10 books that really got circulated, you know, like the Dale Carnegie's and things like that. And, you know, Think and Grow Rich and stuff like that. We had classics, we had a couple of Donald Trump books back then. Yeah. Not a whole lot of, you know, personal development other than business knowledge. Right. And so once you kind of went through those five key books, you're kind of like, okay, now what? <laughs> exactly. So, Nowadays, you can get perspectives from all kinds of people, and I and I definitely encourage that. I, I listen to at least one audio book every single week. So I usually finish the, the end of the year with 60 books under my belt, and that's incredible because I think if I can learn one one piece of knowledge out of a $15 book, it was worth the investment of that book. Right. So that's right. how I see books, and always got to be feeding your mind. I don't listen to music anymore. I love music. I don't listen to it anymore. I listen to podcasts. I listen to audio books. Mm -hmm. That has consumed my time. So I'm working at the gym or commuting or driving. I'm listening to things and I'm learning things rather than just wasting time in that period. But that's how you can gain mentors without having one-on-ones. But yeah. nowadays what I've realized is that I do have mentors. Now I have paid mentors and I always will because I can't sell what I don't believe in because I could have, you could take 10, 10 years to do the same thing. You can, you can go, Hey, I'm self-made and blah, blah, blah. And like wear that on your shoulder and act like you're bad, you know? And, but you know what? It took you 10 years where it could have took you two if you had somebody that actually had done what you want to achieve and got yeah. you there. Yeah. I, I, it's interesting. I mean, you, you talked a lot about, you know, the information that you consume, but you're also very good at, at passing that information on. I mean, you're on, you're on Facebook, you know, doing live videos a lot. Um, just, and you know, other outlets where there's podcasting, I mean, coming on as a guest, like you are on, on rising tide today. And so I, I'm just really grateful to you for, for doing that because I know that, you know, you've got a lot of, a lot of experience and, and a lot of knowledge to share. And, you know, you do that so freely, you know, in so many different avenues, but if there was, if there was one piece of advice that you could go back and kind of tell your kind of pre seven digit exit self or, pre-side hustle self you think would have moved the ball further down the field and quicker I mean it's, it's a little tough asking you this question because I feel like that you know you you kicked the 70 yard field goal right off the bat so um, but what would be one piece of advice that you would give yourself that you think would really resonate with our audience I am a much different person now at 46 versus when I was 16 
And I'll tell you that some advice that I would give myself, especially at the younger age, is that being shy is a waste of time and being shy is going to cost you a fortune. So you mm -hmm. got to come out of your shell. It's not comfortable, even if you're an introvert. I'm introvert. I love being working by myself and I can operate like an extrovert. Public speaking, go get those skills. I wish, I mean, I did it 18 months ago. I joined Toastmasters and forced myself to stand in front of that room every single week for, a, for six, seven months straight. And then I got good enough where I was actually competing in public speaking events and winning those things on a higher level. So that was someone who had no public experience, hated doing selfie videos, hated doing <laughs> in photos unless my wife was taking photos. And I just knew that I had to become the right person to carry the message I have. I had to become the right person to be able to share my story. I had to become that right person to do these podcasts and get the story and the voice and just have that bravery and the courage to put myself out there. And I used to worry so much about what other people thought or what they would say about what I was doing that I would just kind of hide in the background and, and do that whole, you know, bull crap of like, oh, crush it in silence and let your results speak for you. Well, no, I don't believe in that because you can do that, but why? It's like you can actually be more vocal and actually share and more impact people than just keep it in all yourself. I think if you crush things in silence and you keep things to yourself, you're being selfish because you have a lot of knowledge that you could be sharing with the world to help other people get to the same level or better. So it's your duty to get that story out there. It's do, your duty to help other people. And that's what I really enjoy is just really giving back and, and helping people get through these self-limiting beliefs that hold them back. And I, I live by example. I, you know, people that want to go follow me, go look at you know, my Instagram. We can talk about that later where I'll be. But I actually have my original video still on there. And they go back, uh, I think June of 2017, I used to sit in my truck before Toastmasters meetings and practice my speech that I was going to give. And I would just make videos of myself to do that, just to kind of get used to doing it. And it was really awkward and I hated it. I would do, I would do 10 takes. I was nowhere near like doing them live. Like, I would avoid the live button probably for a year. But that was the best I could do. And I video captured that. And, and that's after 10 takes. So the video you see is probably you know, like there was a lot of wor way worse ones. Before that. I said, okay, well, I think this one's good enough to post. And there was people that would laugh at those things and like say, what are you doing? This is dumb. And like, you're, you're just a car guy. They try to minimize you. And, yeah. and I was like, Hey, you know, guys, my, my passion is cars, but it's also business. And I like to help people and I've helped people build seven and eight figure companies in the background. So I need to be the one that's helping people out there public and doing the same right. thing. So I just sucked it up and just invested in myself and got better. So that's the advice I would give to my younger self is, go take public speaking classes like as soon as possible and, and make yourself very uncomfortable and get past that fear. Because just like anything else, when it becomes a skill, you're going to be wanting to show that skill off. It's hmm. not a talent. People are not born as public speakers and have this innate talent. Anytime you see somebody that's up on that stage or doing things like that or speaking very clearly while saying, um, and, ah, and, but, and, uh, and stuff like that, that's a skill. Right. I learned to think about every single word that is coming out my head before I say it. And I, I try to articulate it in a way that the audience will understand without using those filler words and being distractive. These are skills. You can learn them from repetition. You just got to go practice. You got to go invest in yourself. And I guarantee you will see a difference. If you were to do that for six months, you'll be a much different person in six months. And here I am thinking that I was always good at something like that in a corporate level because, hey, guys, I... Oh, I can do public speaking. I've done slideshows. You know, I've, I've led teams of 80 people. Like, I got this. I got this. And I was just lying to myself, Kevin. I was lying <laughs> to myself. Because until you had to get in front of a crowd, tell an engaging story, be able to control your voice, your inflections, your volume, the pitch, yep. that attention, that engagement, you're lying to yourself. You are not entertaining people. You're not engaging people. And these are things that you can actually learn as a skill. It's not something you're born with. And that's the get out of being shy, put yourself out there, gain the public speaking and communication skills, because that's something that you'll carry with you your entire life. I mean, I, I love that. And I, you, you mentioned kind of, you know, the, the haters that you, that you, in, that engaged with you early. I mean, I, I think I, I saw something that said, you know, the people that are criticizing you are people that haven't done it yet. And it is really interesting. I mean, these guys are probably living in their mom's basement. <laughs> and, you know, it's just easy to criticize it, you know, and if you, 
and it is it, it's really kind of almost out of a fear base i mean you know they're they they would never probably engage or take that step that you that you just outlined you know to take a toastmasters course or you know to be engaged with that or just to get out there but i, I love the way you frame that you know being shy is, is not only a waste of time it will cost you a fortune yeah and that goes for anything i mean a lot of people are afraid of being salespeople or things like that but you know what everything in life is sales you're asking out it your is. wife or your, or your husband, that's a sale. You're trying to close a deal. If you're trying to get a promotion at work, you're selling yourself. If you're trying to get a new job, you're selling yourself. These are all sales things. Anytime you have a face-to-face -face conversation and you're trying to convince somebody to do something, that is sales. And communication will greatly, greatly enhance that and your confidence level at the yeah. same time. Well, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to, to take a step in this next, in the, in the next segment of our, our chat here, because I feel like you've almost done this multiple <laughs> times in the interview already, but um, I, I want to transition a little bit into a, a new segment of Rising Tide podcast that we call the, the Rising Tide Micro Course. And so really, I just want, you know, you get to choose the subjects, you know, just kind of really double down and really specifically focus on maybe two or three points that you really want to leave with our listeners, um, whether it's, it's something that is, is leading them into services you provide or just, you know, uh, you could really go back and just outline exactly what you just did talking about, you know, the, the whole idea of putting yourself out there. I mean, you listed two or three things that I, you know, I wrote down as well, but this time is yours. And I just want you to, you know, just uh, grab the mic and, and just share with us, uh, you know, a segment that, that certainly will be on YouTube and just people can really focus on one thing. So take it away. For me, if you're going to start anything, whether that's a business or a fitness, you know, plan or journey, things like that, to me, the mindset is the foundational thing for everything. I think you have to have the strong mindset. Again, that's not something you're born with. It comes from repetition. It keeps from, it comes from being true to yourself, trusting yourself, and you start to get the real confidence when you start to execute things and you're actually starting to see momentum from the progress you make. But I think the mindset is the main thing. And what I'd like to do is share some common excuses people have about starting businesses. Cause I know there's a lot of listeners out there that are curious about this. And I know this is going to resonate with them because they likely use the exact same excuses. And I want to give them kind of re rebuttals to each of those things. Right. So, you know, number one, what is the name excuse? It's, it's fear, self doubt and lack of confidence. That's what keeps most people from starting. You touched on this with the critics. Here's mm -hmm. the thing about fear. It's not, you're not afraid of failure. Everybody talks about that. That's a surface level onion peel type thing where they just give you the outer layer. Like when someone asks you, why aren't some like, yo, yeah, I'm afraid of failing. I don't, I got too much to lose. There's always variations of this fear, but here's the thing. You're not actually afraid of failure. We all fail. We fail every single day in, in different ways. I mean, it can go like, you know, we're at the gym when you're working on your last set of reps, you, you actually work out till you fail, right? So you actually expect to fail as part of the process. To get stronger well business things like that are no no different you have to understand that failure is part of that process but what most people are not they're actually not afraid of fear fear they're afraid of what other people will say about their fear they let other critics mm -hmm. and naysayers dictate their life they're worried about stepping into that spotlight because they're worried about what other people are going to say about them and here's the thing you got to understand about critics and naysayers and haters they ha are just miserable people People who are willing to tear other people down just, just to try to make themselves feel better, it's something that's wrong with them. It's not you. And when you start to actually show empathy for your haters and your critics and understand that maybe there's something going on in their life and they feel the need to drag other people down and, and hang out in their pity party, wallow pool with them, that's, that's the thing that's going to matter. Like when you understand that you can gain empathy for the haters and understand why they're like that, it makes it really easy for you to accept it. Now, that's not going to say that you don't feel emotion from that that sting or that comment or something they said, but you're able to process it better when you understand why they're doing it. You understand the psychology right. behind it. And actually nowadays, whenever I get a critic, especially on Facebook or social media, I use that as a, a lesson to show that my audience, how to handle them. I don't like fight back. And I, when I was a younger, I would try to get in the keyboard warrior stuff and argue back, <laughs> prove them wrong you know, trying to convince them why I'm right. Just, I mean, it, it never works guys. They're not doing it because they want to be proven wrong or, or they don't believe you. They're doing it because there's something internal within them that's causing them some kind of pain, or maybe they're seeing that you're on this trajectory of improving, whether it's your fitness, your business, your relationships, and they see all these things going good for you and their life sucks. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to hold you 
pack down or knock you down a little or try to make you look stupid or try to make you look less intelligent to make themselves feel better. So understand why they do it. It makes it really easy to go through. So the next excuse that keeps people from starting is the, I don't have money. I, I don't have enough money to start a company. Like I'm lacking money. Well, here's the problem guys. That, that is not the actual problem. That's a surface level excuse too, that you tell somebody else that makes a bunch of excuses. Both of you nod at your heads and go, yeah, I don't have money either. It's kind of like this mutual agreement. Like we're not going to expand further into that and understand why we don't have money. So a lot of times people are like, well, I got this dream business, Tony. And you know, I think it's going to take like $3 million to start. And I don't have $3 million. And it's like, well, why don't you start a company that takes $300 to start? And then you see their eyes get big. And it's like, it's like, you know, my dream job, I would love to have an exotic car dealership around a road course that's sitting there and you know, 200 <laughs> acres of land. Like, but I know that's, you know, $500 million or something to have that. I don't have $500 million a year, but what can I do to work towards that? Yeah. Sometimes the dream company is two or three companies down the road. Right. Sometimes people cop out and they're like, oh, well, you know, I can't start my dream business. So I'm just going to stop and just turn my brain off. And to me, you're just a big quitter when you do that because you have to start thinking about climbing those stairs. Like what is the first step? Can I build a company that makes 500,000 a year? Can I build a company that makes 2 million a year? Can I make one that goes 10 million a year? You can scale up different companies by building, scaling, selling. And that's kind of the process. I try to keep people from thinking about that. And a lot of times the money thing is just a real easy, lame, lame excuse. I mean, when I started my first company, I was $40,000 in debt, working three jobs, and had a newborn son. So I don't like hearing people that have excuses about, you know, they're blaming their wife, their kids, things like that for them not doing things because what it comes down to it is the other excuse number three is I don't have time. I don't have time, Tony. Man, I'd love to start a company. I don't have time. Well, you know what? We all have the same 24 hours a day. Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, has the same 24 hours a day and he manages probably you know, a thousand different companies that are spinoffs from Amazon. But how does he do it? Well, he's got a team. Well, yeah but he's still got the same 24 hours a day. You don't think he's busier than you? And you start to think about that and you go, how many times, like, I don't have time is my favorite excuse because that's the excuse that people who hang around with other excuse makers like to share with each other. They say, hey, I don't have time, man. I'd love to do that. I don't have time. And they're like, yeah, you're right, man. I don't have time either. Like, We're cool. And the conversation usually just ends right there, right? That's how it is. Or what you watch on Netflix last night. <laughs> yeah. So they, they tell someone like me that, and I'm like, oh, you don't have time? It's like, let me see. I'm running three companies. I do private coaching, and I do public speaking events, and I still do social media, and I create all these different things for content. I, mean, I don't know, man. I still go to the gym. I'm in the best shape of my life. I was like, I don't know. Kids, I, guess, I, guess, I guess I, I guess, yeah, I guess I don't have time, you know? And, and I think about it. So I was like, let's think about what you do after your normal job. I get it. If you have a job and you have bills to pay, that's your responsibility. You got to do that. What do you do when you get home? Well, you know, I, I, uh, I sit on the couch and I watch the show or, yeah, and it's like, so here's what I want people to reframe themselves. Whatever you're doing right now, whatever you're doing on a daily basis, those are your priorities. Exactly. Those are your priorities. And when you start to reframe it as I don't have time versus it's not my priority, some of those things that you're doing are going to cause you a little pain. And I want you to pay attention to that pain because that pain is telling you that you shouldn't be doing it. You should be working on something else. So I'm not going to say I don't like in, you know, watching TV. My wife wants me to watch TV sometimes with her and we watch a show. But there's also times I'm watching those shows thinking, man, I should be doing something else. Like this is not this. I enjoy it, but it's not my priority. And I, you know, damn sure whenever I have things to do and I should be doing it, I will not be sitting there watching TV. Right. You know, me, me being fit and, and eating right and doing things is my priority. Health is a priority. It makes no sense to be financially successful and unhealthy and sick and no energy. Exactly. Like, you know, you got to put your health first. We only get to, you know, that's the only thing we can take care of is our health. So understand like when you're watching TV, that's your priority. When you're playing video games, that's your priority. When you're surfing Facebook or social media for hours, that's your priority. And when you tell people like, I don't have time to start a company or do this or get fit. It's like, you're just telling them that that's not your priority. Yeah. So it's a oh. big excuse guys. Don't fall into that trap just because your friends tell you that same excuse. I mean, I love those three you just outlined. I mean, it is, you know, if you can overcome those three, those are kind of the three biggest objections you would hear over and over and over again about, you know, starting a company. I mean, it's, I'm afraid, you know, fear is a big issue. I don't have money and I don't have time. I mean, what a, what a great, you know, way to, to kind of 
uh, rebut those three things, you know, those three main excuses, like you mentioned early in there of, of starting a business. And Tony, I just, I'm just really grateful for you taking the time to kind of unpack that for us a little bit. And just so much, so much more that we've heard in the last, you know, half hour that we've been, we've been chatting is, is there anything that I haven't touched on that you want to, you want to kind of just close our time out here? And then I also wanted to, you to tell our listeners where, where is the best place to find you online? I'd say for a closing statement, what I'd like to have people understand is that you have to remove self-limiting beliefs. And I want to, I want to really speak to the people who grew up in middle class and lower middle class like I did to understand where I'm going with this because the middle class is actually the hardest group and it's also the largest group. It's actually the hardest group to grow up in. It's the hardest group to, to thrive within. And here's why. When you're young, especially high school age and you got parents telling you, Hey, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do? With your life? And they're pressuring you to do all these things. And, and they, and they, you have these people and, and your parents, friends and your peers and your teachers and your college professors. And they're all telling you, if you can make six figures, you're going to be successful. We've heard this in our entire life. I heard that my entire life. And so I'm asking the question, just like everybody else, like, how do I make six figures? I never thought I would be a millionaire. I mean, come on. Yeah. I, it wasn't even within my reality dreams. I mean, I grew up in a thousand square foot home with two windows on the front and a one car garage. So, you know, the, one of the worst neighborhoods in my small city, a great city, but literally it was like the one step up from the trailer park neighborhood. And some of the other kids would make fun of the neighborhood we grew up in. So it kind of give you an idea that my goals were set really low. Right. Even though I knew that I could do things, I just never really thought on a financial level that I would get there. And a lot of people, unfortunately, get stuck in that because that's all they know. They're surrounded by people who aspire to be average and they're lied to by telling them, like, hey, if you can make $100,000, you're going to be successful. And I get it because there's probably a lot of listeners out there that are not at that level yet. And they're like, man, I would like to make 100 you know, figures. Like, who's this guy? Like, he's a jerk. You know, he's telling me that that's not successful. It's not. Mm. Because you have way more capability than that. You have so much more capability than you can believe. But the fact is, is you've created goals around what other people have defined for you. So when you have, you know, cousin Joe and teacher, Miss Smith and professor John and your, your current boss, like, Hey, someday you're going to get that big promotion. I'm going to pay you $70,000 <laughs> creating all these upper limits for you by telling you this fallacy that a hundred thousand dollars and that salary range is successful that you can have a mortgage and you can have a brand new car and, you know, two kids and, you know, all these things, these little check boxes that people create for the middle class that say that if you make this level and you have all these things, like you are successful in our eyes, mm -hmm. so what happens is you set your goals that low. And sometimes you don't even hit that goal because you've created such a low goal because you've put in such a low effort of work, right. low, effort, low effort of investment to get to that level and now when you get there, you're like, oh, I guess I'm here, you know, and I'm, a, I'm, a, if you're looking around and you're making a hundred, $120,000 and you're the most successful of all your friends, like, I hate to tell you, you're not going to go any better. I hate to tell you that because you are surrounded by other people who have praised you and told you how successful you are because you've arrived at that level and you're not going to challenge yourself. You've fallen into a complacency trap and you're going to ride that out until you're, you know, 65 and you, and you, you have hopefully a retirement saved up and then you're going to die. And that's not how life should be. Mm. We should always be learning and we should always be challenging ourselves and removing these limits, making a million dollars, making a billion dollars. Do you think Jeff Bezos, you know, when he was a kid, like I'm going to be a billionaire someday or multi-billionaire? Like, no, no, absolutely not. Elon Musk, exactly. He never thought he was going to be a billionaire. Like, come on guys. Yeah. They just don't have limits. I don't have limits. I don't set limits. I, I put in work. I want to learn new things. I challenge myself. I look for more opportunities. And I keep trying to build these building, you know, building bricks, building blocks to get to where I want to go. Mm -hmm. So you got to get away from letting your goals. Like, I want you to really think about the goals you currently have and ask yourself, are those your goals or is that the environment you grew up in that created those goals for you? Man, what a what a great question! I and I I promised you this. I you had the last word, but man, you you sparked something in me. I got to ask one more follow up question. So. When, when your side business took off, did you believe that it had that kind of, kind of potential before it happened or did the fact that it happened cause you to start believing? Do you understand the question? I mean, yes. which came first, the chicken or the egg here? I Absolutely. Mean, I, I did not believe that it had the potential to make that kind of money. I mean, just so you, for your listeners, uh, that website, we were making about 400000 in profit per year. 
And that was something that only took me about 30 minutes a day. Wow. And even the, the wheel on an online wheel retail company I've had for 12 years, that was a spinoff. It was actually a side hustle within that side hustle. Mm -hmm. I sell about $800,000 in wheels a year and then it takes me 30 minutes a day. But you've got a completely different mindset in 2019 than you, than you had in 2005 Absolutely. or six, I'm sure. Absolutely. I, I understand that there are no limits and I don't believe in trading hours for dollars. Yeah. That's, that's a terrible, terrible employee mindset. It serves most of the people. They think that they're, they define their current worth based on the hourly rate or the salary range they're at. So you got a $20 an hour person thinking like, I'm a $20 an hour person. Like, no, you're not. You're, you're, you're way more valuable than that. You just have to create that value. You got somebody that's making a hundred thousand dollars and they're, they're hoping that they can make 150,000 someday. Like they set these really low goals. It's like, you could do that. And you know, here's the thing here's, you could climb the corporate ladder. You can get that degree like I got, and you can go all the way to the top and you can hope to make $200,000 as a salary in 25 years. That's the average. If you're going to get in that middle management, large, medium sized companies, you can maybe do that in 25 years, or you can start a business and do it in two years. Mm. Like, take your pick. Yep. And the fact, I mean, just the, your, your own value of your own feeling of self-worth and, you know, and, and accomplishment and you're actually chasing your own dream instead of somebody else's. So Tony, tell us how we can find you online. If you want to find me, just my website's the easiest place is 365driven.com. So 365driven.com. And you'll find links to all my socials. I'm very active on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, most of the social channels, and also you can find the link to my podcast and my best-selling book. And that's the numbers, 365driven.com, right? Correct. That's not spelled okay. Well, Tony, thank you so much for just uh, just joining us today and taking time out of your schedule. I know that, uh, you know, if you were going to charge me this for our coaching, I, I would have to take out a loan. So I, I appreciate just the time you spent. And just thanks for just pouring into our audience, our listeners, and, and those that are going to listen in the future and just really playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Tony, thanks again. Thanks, Kevin. Glad to be on the show.